Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union. It's an exciting day as we're looking at United Nations Day, which was most recently celebrated. And we're also on the eve of Glasgow for the globe. Today we'll be looking at the human rights measurement index, sharing what we are and what to do next. And it's exciting to be looking at measuring human rights in Oceania, the Pacific movement to protect Moana Nui Akea. I'm so honored to have two young, amazing activists with me here today from Kanaki, New Caledonia, as well as Aotearoa, New Zealand. Thank you both for joining us. How are you doing today, Charm? Kia ora, Josh. Uh, thank you for um, having us both here today. Um, calling from a lockdown um, in Tamaki Makoto and Aotearoa. Um, so it's been about 70 something days now. So yeah, it's been tough for everybody, but you know, this is the best thing for us right now. Thank you, Charmin. It is true. Health is a human right, and it's important. And I remember many times talking with you, and I'd be walking in a mask, and you'd be like, you're still wearing masks. So the world does ebb and flow like the beautiful ocean that we live in, and we hope you'll be out of lockdown soon and also be able to be free and enjoying that health as a human right. And Yolene, you're calling and talking with us from Kanaki, New Caledonia. How are things there, and what are you doing today? Yes, hello, thank you, uh, Joshua, for the invitation. Um, doing pretty fine. Also in the lockdown in New Caledonia, uh, we found ourselves in a, such a particular moment in history and for the country also. And I'm keeping asking myself uh, if we're in a state of recovery or transformation <laughs> while we're addressing all uh, our challenges uh, as a whole. To our, uh, our fundamental rights, especially for indigenous uh, peoples in our myriads uh, of uh, island nations uh, to climate justice also and sustainable development. But yeah, other than that, uh, everything is going perfectly. That is good. Charm, we'll start with you. Can you share with us the major human rights challenges and concerns, as well as the obstacles, but also the opportunities with human rights in Aotearoa today? Kia ora, Josh. Um, so at the moment, um, there is a lot going on. So first, I um, just want to make it clear, I'll be uh, presenting in my personal capacity. Um, so from a Ngāti Wairiri perspective, that's my um, tribe that I'm from in um, New Zealand. Um, there's a lot of issues around Tinoranga Tiritanga at the moment. So that's self-determination. and at the moment in New Zealand, the government is working towards a national action plan on implementation on the Declaration or the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, engagements are just about to start with that. And again, um, in relation to the environment and issues around that, particularly um, when we're looking at these different human rights, um, it's really important that consultation is done properly. So it's not just about you know, doing a tick box and getting um, a tribe like mine on the board. It's actually involving us from the start of a, um, a kaupapa or, sorry, what's the um, translation, like the start of um, work. So, for example, um, we do a lot of work around um, resource consent. So with the local council where my tribe is in, um, we've been working to be part of the long-term plans and ensuring that... Um, we are sharing our views around water quality um, and things like that. So it's not just us sitting at the table, it's our whakapapa link, which is our genealogical link. So when we're deciding on um, how to be involved in kaupapa or um, your different issues, it's how is it going to impinge on Ngāti Wairere rights? What is that, um, what, what's going to be caused to our genealogy by the work that might be done and if, um, if there are issues around it, how can we work with the councils or other bodies to get a good outcome for everybody? And again, it's just reiterating back that human right to self-determination. So um, if you're looking at the articles in UNDRA, it would be specifically Article 3, so that's self-determination, tēnoranga tiritanga, and also protecting our environments, that Article 29. And um, in particular, looking at the UNDRA action plan, it's also the blueprint honouring um, Te Tiriti or Waitangi, which is the um, treaty that was signed between Māori Rangatira, which are the chiefs, and the Crown back in 1840. 
And so for us in Aotearoa, on a, on a wider perspective, the action plan is the blueprint to having those honours, um, not those honours, sorry, those obligations honoured by the government. So that's kind of what's going on at the moment in a, a very brief nutshell. Thank you so much. And Tinoranga, Tiratanga, I mean, self-determination is the most important aspect. And that definitely is important as we'll move into Kanaki. You also talked about free, fair, and informed consent, which is mentioned six times in the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So all that is absolutely essential as we look at going forward. And really, I, I love and appreciate you bringing up the individual, but also the collective right and understanding those in that holistic perspective. Moving over to Sailing Arvaka over to Kanaki. Yolene, can you share with us some of those important human rights issues taking place now in Kanaki and very much, of course, self-determination is, is on the forefront, but many others exist as well. Yes, sure. So um, in terms of the unique um, human rights uh, aspect uh, in the New Caledonia, I uh, strongly sense that we should look at, uh, we're in a, really in a great period of creative advocacy, and I strongly sense that we should look at the strategy for utilizing this open door that was the public consultation made uh, uh, twice of the civil society this year by the, the state and initiated for the next steps uh, for societal progress in New Caledonia. And this is a great initiative that must not remain in vain and fade away in the long run. So I think that this wave of interest towards um, civil society should be analyzed to determine uh, the immediate work we need to start on now. And um, as after a long hiatus in the peaceful era of the Numea Accords, uh, which is uh, ending, and um, yeah, using these creative methods to explore our social issues and explain the, the, the complex uh, um, concept uh, to engage our people uh, more on an emotional level. And it is a great way for us to explore issues that may be difficult to discuss uh, in an open manner uh, and create a safe environment for the civil society and uh, indigenous peoples in general to voice their thoughts and, and, and feelings. And that, that has been the tradition that has always been uh, being a peacemaker. And with this spirit uh, in New Caledonia, we understood barely, very early uh, on the meaning and the interest of uh, managing together in partnership, especially uh, in the frontline issues. And what I sense in the actual ambience in the country is that we're aiming to making a difference at a time when the Indo Pacific access matters more for our governments and for geopolitical reasons of uh, global governance. And uh, in these spaces uh, we exist in, um, with this other layer, uh, us as uh, indigenous peoples, we have to constantly uh, explain why we are different. Uh, but overall, uh, I want to bring back the question on why we're, we are uh, we're the same. What, what, what is the, the thing that we share in common? And we share the, the same values uh, in building the, the quality of life for our communities in, in New Caledonia, ensuring that we're all uh, allowed to show up uh, authentically, uh, ensuring that we can show up and fight for our land, for our people. And uh, this is possible through, through different ways by establishing a culture of human rights still in New Caledonia and engaging our partnership uh, systems and connecting our advocacy uh, with our own cultural values. So I can develop more on that later on uh, if, you, if you will. Oh no, it's excellent and it's really, Oh, you've summarized it, the authenticity of the creative advocacy moment we find ourselves in. There's our urgency, but also the agency where you can be involved in, and have a huge impact. And I really wanna thank you both also for the historical context, because with the historical context, what you're showing is what's possible and what we're facing today. And you're looking at processes for peace and human rights from that long-term perspective. So I really wanna thank you both Charm, you mentioned the Treaty of Waitangi. We know that was 1840 and in early February. Could you maybe share how that process has moved forward? And then, of course, Yolene afterwards, can you share about 
the other accords and, and where you're at in that process for those important votes on self-determination. Arm? Kia ora for the question. Um, so for those of you who aren't um, aware of what the Treaty of Waitangi is, it's um, so the Treaty of Waitangi was signed between the um, Crown and Māori Rangatira chiefs back in 1840. And essentially what that document said was um, Māori, Rangata Whenua, people of the land will govern their people and the Crown will govern their people. So we gave um, all people coming here the right to be able to set up and establish themselves, but we retained our tino rangatiratanga self-determination. Um, and as years have gone by, um, it's been the English version which has had more precedence. We've had um, cases uh, like we in Prata, where um, it's a famous case where Judge Prentagast ruled the uh, treaty as a nullity, which um, is really upsetting for coming to Whenua people. But essentially the point that I, um, I emphasise is since those kinds of decisions have been, um, or those determinations have been said, that's kind of the attitude that the government has taken towards um, Te Tiriti or Waitangi. However, it's really positive at the moment. Um, there is a huge appetite, um, not only within the government, but other organisations to do things in a Te Tiriti based um, manner. So um, if we look at the Matiki Mai report um, that was uh, written by um, Moana Jackson and Professor Margaret Mutu, there is a model called um, the relational sphere. So it's essentially we've got the Māori sphere of the rangatira or the chiefs, and then you have the government. So a picture of Venn diagram, and then in the middle, it's those the area that we work together. So there's a lot more approaches within the government trying to adopt that model so that there is equal power sharing between the two. And by doing that way, it actually is honouring the um, the uh, te or Waitangi. And so um, at the moment, there are things like the National Action Plan Against Racism, where these types of methodologies are um, trying to be um, implemented and a lot of work with the National Iwi Cares Forum, which are the highest body of Māori representatives for different tribes. And so I think the importance there is that there is there is an appetite, there's still a long way to go, but it requires um, our government and other organisations to step out of the usual business of way of doing things. And I think there is also that fear. It's like, well, if we give Indigenous people that you know equal power, what does that give to us? I think it's just um, about people being comfortable to be uncomfortable and to try things in a different approach. Oh, that's so well summarised. And and it goes back historically. I remember also Efiti, who did pull up all the government leaders that were trying to demarcate the land and saying he took out the post and then planted seeds and he said he would share the food, but that no one could own the land. So it's always been the settler societies that haven't quite comprehended the rich heritage and knowledge of indigenous peoples in that spirituality, plus also genuine connection with the earth, with the Aina. So it's great that you brought that up, but I loved also your double spears and putting that together because then it clearly defines there are certain things of self-determination that Maori should just have full ability to exercise and that's been denied so that's getting back to those aspects and that's a big part of the human rights measurement index and then you'll lean that allows us to shift over there have been a couple of accords that have happened over time with France trying to exercise some elements of these human rights themes of decolonization could you share with us maybe the highlights of what has happened? And then I know there's an important date coming up as well in November, potentially, if that referendum will go forward with COVID. But could you share people how the amazing Kanaki from Jean-Marie Jibaou and others have brought forward that vision of the land and exercise self-determination, but make sure that human rights are promoted and protected, Yuli? Yeah, sure. So, um... With the heavy lifting work that had been done by our predecessor uh, and uh, notably uh, Mr. Jean-Marie Chibaou, um, we are in a period when we have to decide ourselves on our self-determination. So the third referendum will be held on the 12th of December if there is a change uh, uh, 
no change from the state uh, regarding uh, those days and regarding also the sanitary crisis uh, in your colonia. But um, establishing when establishing this culture of human rights in New Caledonia and towards this uh, movement uh, towards our uh, our self determination determination uh, there is a, a an important role we have to play to promote and protect the the rights and our dignity as a as a people and especially Kanak in this uh, country uh, uh, wants to go in the right direction and it is going in the right direction i would say but there's still um still there's a lot of misunderstandings about uh human rights and it seems like uh, in our mind we have the concept but we still need the proper studies or the proper public consultations with the customary authorities uh with the society again and more thorough consultation like what has been done in trade unions also and so on. And we have to draw uh, a guideline towards that kind of, uh, the kinds of go governance uh, of this culture of human rights. And um, this would be successful, I guess, if at the early stages of the development, there is confidence that our government and the many partners lining up uh, have to provide leadership. Very essential that there is no question of uh, that there is no question of any political agenda, uh, especially during this time in the country when we're heading towards this third referendum on self-determination. And um, this movement is basically helping our people being uh, better human beings, accepting to build relationships with organizations like our local NGOs, uh, community organizations and institutions, and making, making them really effective. And that is what we need to work with a, a wide range of organizations and it will secure the our resources and with those resources we will strengthen the relationships with the communities and it'll show that the core issues of indigenous peoples are really understood and that will lead to a coordinated advocacy uh, for the rights of the communities also in general because um well, one, it's another point is that the community awareness uh, to collaborate for inclusion uh, must totally be addressed uh, with solutions driving change, positive change. Uh, being a multi ethnic uh, country with also Polynesians, Wallachians, in Ukraine, especially by making a, uh, a national report, for instance, that could shed uh, lights onto some of the stuff that's happening in the country for all the communities living uh, together here. And I think that's an alternative uh, way to be here for us because uh, nobody wants to be the centerpiece of complaint <laughs> when you have uh, so much uh, going on. And what I'm striving for is uh, to have back backups. Uh, and here I'm talking about civil society, uh, working in an NGO, NGO, and supporting uh, work for consultations with the people in their homes. So that will be quite difficult now uh, with the sanitary crisis, but eventually there will still be people wanting to talk about uh, the matters that affect us, affect them. And uh, we're here actually to give them access to this information and helping out on resolving whatever it may be. And what, what's in it, you know, it's building a strong human rights culture in New Caledonia first, uh, by attacking some sort of confusion that this could be not useful. And that was the mindset not so long ago, uh, before all the public consultation. So we invest our efforts in uh, something that has a uh, meaning for us. Uh, our advocacy and how uh, it tackles some some injustice and strengthen our local culture. So, um, Thank you so much. And it allows us to look at the human rights measurement index that was just reported. How do you think they did it, noting the human rights record for your country and Aotearoa, New Zealand, as well as Kanaki? And maybe you could share some of the highlights that were raised that you think are very important and some next steps to really promote and protect human rights in Aotearoa, Charm? 
Yeah, so um, looking at uh, the, the findings on that, um, we have a huge housing crisis, first of all, um, in Aotearoa. Um, there are a lot of people um, who don't have access to homes or, or land or anything like that, and in particular, the case for tangata whenua or Māori is even more dire, and um, really that relates back to you know, all of the processes that colonisation has um, impacted on my people. Um, I know that there are a lot of um, movements by different tribes and the government working together to ensure that more opportunities become available to Māori people, to whether that's becoming first home buyers or methods trying to, to work around that. Um, but again, it, it goes back to, you know, if you look at the land and the land is unhealthy, then your people are unhealthy. And it's so unfortunately the the, the issues impacting tanga to whenua, they're so intersectional. So it's our health systems, our education systems, justice system, they all um, play a part in that and they keep putting us at persistent disadvantage. And so when we talk about, um, you know, the findings, or it's particularly around housing, it's not just a one method approach, it's a whole systematic approach that needs to be undertaken. And so um, I guess just drawing on um, from what my um, tribe is doing, um, they're actively involved in things like the restoration of wetlands because the wetlands are like our kidneys, right? And they keep us going. And so for us, we're doing a lot of work around that at the moment um, and just trying to ensure that we're part of that. And um, I guess, like, if you look at Ngāti Wairere, that's our, um, that's my tribe. We have had so much happen to us and we're still at the stages of trying to form our own entity so that we can finish our um, negotiations to get our land back and things like that. So from a personal perspective, that's what we're doing, but I do know that there's other things going on, you know, government policy-wise to try and encourage um, more greater home ownership. So well, that is exactly what we're looking at. And you pointed out something, of course, if the land is healthy, then the people are healthy. And so the decolonization question is linked to all human rights. So I really love that holistic perspective. And the other side then that relates to where we're headed towards, we're on the eve of Glasgow, and you talked about the wetlands, and that's important with biological diversity. And of course, also your people would be more knowledgeable about how to care for the lands after centuries, of course, of taking care of them. So can you share a little bit more about some other environmental issues or issues related to climate justice that are at the forefront yeah. of so, Maui? Um, one of the um, issues that we're having at the moment, so we have a, a river called the Waikato River and there's like obviously climate change change is terrible everywhere, but um, along the banks of the river, we used to have um, past sites for like where we all used to congregate and live, but with colonization and the cities, like they were destroyed, but we'd have a lot of artifacts that are still there, but with climate change, it's been, um, I'm not a, a, a science expert, but the, the land has been um, degrading and things have been coming out. And so with that, we've had um, people picking up our tonga or our, our sacred objects and that has become like a huge issue and um, particularly some city councils um, in the legislation if, if they are carbon dated to a specific date well then that should go in like a museum and so one of the things we've been really really stringent on well is that if that is a wide area artifact that comes to us and we determine what then happens with that artifact and it's that whole decolonization process but being very uh, strong in that and all of these issues are linked to climate change and so I personally worry about um, throughout New Zealand how many of these kinds of similar situations are happening and people going around fossil king and unfortunately because of the impact of climate change I think we're going to see like a heavier issue with these kinds of situations. Um, yeah, different perspective on that, but still very valid. Absolutely, and it connects so much. Also, there is that model of Vanganui with the river, and your point that you brought up earlier, where people don't have to be afraid, because in the beginning, it was equal, equal in the management, and then now Maori have an extra vote, and the river didn't dry up, the river didn't stop flowing, the world still exists. So making sure that Maori rights are recognized actually only strengthens the entire country. 
Yeah, and I think that's um, something that probably not a pe not a lot of people in our country realise. And some um, oh, there are rivers that now have their own legal entity. And like for us, we see that the the river, like many other indigenous um, nations around the world, that is a living ancestor for us. And um, as such, we treat it like that. And so when you have people going and taking these artifacts that are so precious to us that should you know stay in the land. It's those kinds of issues that are going to um, come around more with the impact of climate change. It, it's scary. Yeah, and it's, it's that understanding of a living ancestor. Jolene, I know you were at COP25 in Madrid. What are some of the issues you're looking at going forward? And how do those issues relate, of course, to what's happening in Kanaki on the ground on climate justice? Yes, so uh, when I was in uh, COP25, um, this was uh, for me um, a great experience uh, as uh, where I was in constant learning from each other. And uh, I realized there that our problems are not that different from others because we have some serious violation in the Pacific uh, also that need to be addressed. Uh, and uh, it's really important in my eyes and it's quite necessary to have um, precisely to this polyphony, international polyphony so that we understand the approaches and the perceptions uh, um, for each countries and its people and see it's so important to hear and it's uh, well um, well shown in the in the right structure for new colonia and the results like new caledonia uh, on the way we measure the human rights performance uh, by going straight to the human rights advocate and asking uh, them to, to let uh, to let them know how their government are doing in terms of uh, you know meeting their human rights performances and also in terms of uh, the, the climate change and we don't with the result that has been uh, on this year uh, in New Caledonia, um, we're not that uh, vulnerable, but I mean, in terms of the um, the the process, the the process, just to have the data disaggregated. Uh, you guys know that in the environment we live in, everything has to be qualitative as well. So everything has to be in empirical and for you to even, or for us to even make sense of that. So when we see those numbers, uh, that's when we need to do this uh, data aggregation when we advocate to our institutions and look at the specific need of our community, especially uh, in the, the challenges we're experiencing with the um, the environmental crisis and yeah. Well, thank you. And we're looking today at the importance of the human rights measurement index. And then at COP, we'll have the nationally determined contributions. And so all of these pieces come together so that we can have a holistic perspective of the way forward to promote and protect human rights as well as our planet. I know we're close to time. I want to thank both of you for taking time out of your busy activists and advocate schedules doing the important work on the ground. But I know you're both also very active at the global level and look hope and forward to seeing you again in the very near future when you are out of lockdown and we're both enjoying liberty and promoting human rights together. Mahalo Nui. <laughs>